Did you hear the one about the famous violinist who played in a subway station and no one noticed? Well, it was a different story today, and Jeffrey Brown was there. It was a sight that almost no one watched as it happened, but gained much attention afterwards. A superstar of the classical musical world, Joshua Bell, playing in a metro station in Washington, D.C. in 2007, largely ignored by a few thousand commuters on their way to work. An article by Gene Weingarten of the Washington Post about the event or non-event won a Pulitzer Prize. Now 46, Joshua Bell has been performing in the world's greatest halls since he was a teenager. And he's recorded more than 40 albums, including a brand new one of compositions by Bach. But something about the subway performance captured the imagination of many and apparently of Bell himself. because there he was earlier today at Washington's Union Station Metro. This time, though, the performance had been publicized. Bell brought along a group of young musicians he's been working with for an HBO Masterclass program, and with word out that this was no mere busker asking for a few dollars, a crowd was on hand. Bell joined us to talk soon after. So it, it was better this time? <laughs> a lot better this time. A lot better. Yeah, this was fun. This, I actually really enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it the first time around that much, but it was, although I was amused the first time around. Well, wait a minute. Why did you not enjoy it? Music really, uh, you, need, you need the give and take from the audience and the feeling of, of attention. Uh, and uh, it's <laughs> not about me. Not getting, it's not right? about my attention to me. It's about the music itself. You know, it, part of the reason why I accepted to come here about the invitation of the Union Station is that they said this time we're going to ask, tell people about it, yeah. spread the word, and, and, and hopefully you'll get a, a, a captive audience. And I said, you know, this is precisely what the whole original experiment, which was not a scientific in any way, uh, that's really what it was about. It all kind of raises the question of, of how classical music should or could be presented, right? I mean, should it be done in different venues? Should you try out different things? Should you reach people in different ways. Well, I think it's, I th I'm always interested in reaching people in different ways, not by not by just standing on a randomly on a subway platform with your with your case with open. my case open. That's not really a great way. But this is an example of of I think this shows that there is interest in classical music from from a wide range of people. Um, this I felt I felt like a, it was, I mean I have to say I felt like one of the Beatles today. <laughs> this is great. People, well, you this almost part, got the hair. I don't right. normally get that kind of response for you know people grabbing at me in the stage. It was so fun for me. Um, but it, but I think uh, I think there. There's, we need to ex experiment with more crea creative ways of reaching audiences. What about the idea, and I, I was thinking of this as, as they started clapping after the first movement. Sometimes there's this discussion in classical oh, music yeah. circles, you know, should we encourage people to clap? Should it be a less formal experience? Well, first of all, people, if you go back 100 years or 200 years when the music of Mendelssohn was being performed, People did clap yeah. uh, after the uh, first movement. You know, when when ba when Beethoven's Seventh Symphony was premiered after the second movement, they clapped so much that they had to repeat the second movement and mm -hmm. do it again. I yeah. mean, so there was a different kind of vibe. And so when people today say you're not supposed to clap, I actually say, you know, it's, historically it's actually inc incorrect. And and uh, I enjoy uh, I enjoy it. when I hear people clapping at the wrong times. I think that's great. We got a listener that's not used to going to. We got a new listener, and that uh -huh. just that excites me. Yeah, but you don't want to discourage that right so, do you, so I do you, don't I've had conductors playing with conductors that turn around to the audience and say don't don't clap you know and, and, and then I'll, I, I'll usually turn to the audience and say come on do it <laughs> we often hear about the crisis of classical yeah. music right about the aging audience about the do you sense that or do, you, do what, what do you see well I think people have been talking about the aging audience for for a hundred years now and they sim somehow people keep replacing those older people um, uh, because I think the, the problem is that, I mean, classical music so often we come to it late in life as you're looking for something something in music that's not just about trend, being trendy and what's popular, but something that profoundly affects you. And I think great classical music and jazz and other things, it, it, but I, there's no reason why we can't reach younger people. And I'm, I'm not pessimistic about it. I think there's, look at the young people there today and there I see, a lot of them, I, after every concert, I, I 
greet young people in the lobbies, and I talk, and I see a huge surge of young people playing music. So, but I think where we need to work on is getting it, making sure that it's just part of everyone's educational diet in the school. You know, music and art is part of what it means to be a human being, and to and to make it just an extracurricular thing is, is sad because um, most, most kids will get, not get any musical experience if they don't have it in their school at some point. And yet that is happening in a lot it's of places. It's happening and that's what I'm, I'm spending a lot of energy trying to encourage um, change in that, in that way. I'm working with Education Through Music which is ETM which is an organization that puts classical music programs in or just music programs in inner city schools that have no music programs. And, I, and we've seen incredible, the test scores go up all across the board. Their self-esteem of these kids that have an instrument in their hand and play together. It's, if you saw that, if, if anyone saw that, they, they would think it's ludicrous ever to cut out music from, from, a, from your school. And I hope people will, will get that message. Speaking of young people, you yourself started as such a young person. I did. You have been at this a long time. Do you feel a pressure to, to keep um, I don't know, finding new ways to do new repertoire, new approaches, new, new venues like this. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a pressure, it's just, uh, for me, it's, it's a, the music world and the, the things that I want to do is so huge that it's just, in, uh, the only thing that makes me sad is that there's not enough time in my lifetime to do all the things I want to do. Are you done with uh, subway stations for now? I think this is a perfect end to the whole story. <laughs> there have been a lot of chapters that I'd, were unanticipated. There's a children's book about it. There have been sermons from preachers and ministers and politicians who've talked, referenced the, the, and and it's been kind of fun following the journey. But this, I think, was a perfect kind of cap ending to 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 the story, and and um, I couldn't have been more pleased with it. All right, Joshua Bell. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me today.